Welcome to part two of our basic painting. Um, we're doing an arch architectural painting. Uh, we're doing it in monochrome. Here I'm using titanium white, Mars black, and yellow ochre. If you missed the first part, be sure and go check that out because that goes over some things about the layout and the basic shapes and some concerns to keep in mind. This is done using an underdrawing in HB pencil and um, that kind of gave us a little concept to lean on so that we can work on other concepts kind of one at a time as we build. So we can be assured that we've got a pretty good layout, pretty good shapes here. And it, at any point in a painting, you want to be confident that you can go back and reevaluate and make big changes if you need to. There's no reason that you can't. Here, I'm mixing a shadow value that's semi-dark. It's not very dark um, because it, it only needs to go to about 50 to 70 percent um, to act as a shadow on this on this building. And what I'm picking up on in the reference is that the uh, bell tower kind of casts a shadow onto the main part of the cathedral. So um, I want to create a shadow that's big enough to catch that. I also noticed that there's a harsh edge on one side of it, um, and then it's very diffuse on the other. Um, there might even be a little flux of light before you hit that hard, ed hard edge over there, um, because it's also running up to the end of the building. I want to be sure that it's wide enough that it actually makes sense, and, um, and I need to go all the way up to the very top of the building just to be sure that I've um, achieved what I need to achieve. And you know, I'm trying to find where to stop this. And I can add more medium to kind of do a little bit of glazing because my under layer is dry now, or dry enough to glaze over. So I can actually get this shadow to sort of fade out a little bit if I use a lot of medium. And then now that I've got that shadow value, I can do things like I notice at the bottom of the tower that there's a dark value and that it gets lighter as it goes up to the second sort of story or the second register where there's some uh, statues and little niches and I can create that transition immediately. So the, the next concept that we're stacking on is we're stacking on transitions. So we want the value to kind of change over these large planes, you know, having a flat value has a lot of graphic power, and then having transitions allows you to describe lighting. So I have the sun shining through the clouds somewhere off to the left, um, about 45 degrees up and a little bit backlit. So I know that that's going to cast certain shadows. The other thing too that I want to lay out that I haven't laid out is cast shadows. Um, it's not really part of the transition, but um, laying out any cast shadows um, immediately doubles down on your sense of space. So connecting the ground shadow from tower over to the cathedral is, is the main cast shadow that we have to be concerned with because it's really the only one we see other than the ones cast by the people. Um, the other concepts that I can work with here are um, I can run in with details on the architecture. Since I have this sort of dark value mixed up, I can find more places where that value is. Um, so there's a, a dark area on the very top of the tower. So I can lay that out fairly quickly. It doesn't actually have to be a huge value jump, as long as it's different from the value that you put down on the first layer. There's um, a similar value on the same part of the architecture on the actual uh, main part of the building itself running all the way along. And having that line is going to help me with my perspective as well because it's reinforcing the, uh, the linear perspective direction. It's, I'm working on a triangle now, so running this value down is it just reinforcing the fact that this uh, building is going back in space. Um, if you're 
I'm familiar with linear perspective, um, going back and taking a look at some uh, concepts on perspective from drawing are going to be critical. Um, the basic idea is that you, if you make a triangle go to a vanishing point, then it looks like it's going back in space. And anytime you do perspective, you're working with triangles. Um, the other thing that, I've, that I'm doing here is I've switched to a smaller brush. And I need to do things like flatten out this dark value a little more. Um, when you're working with background uh, shapes in architecture, it's best, if you can, to get them to be like flat and one-sided shapes so that they sit in the background. If you do too much dimension in the background, too much lighting, um, too much of value range, it pulls forward and kind of fights what you're trying to do with the whole uh, painting itself. This also allows you to uh, mess with edges and make sure that you've cleaned up the edges on the actual building as well, and that you've covered the whole paper properly. And want to preserve that little bit of light uh, on the far side of that cast shadow as well. It can be difficult sometimes to paint over really dark areas with light. Sometimes you have to use really thick paint. And then, now that I've used a very dark value, I probably need to clean the brush a little bit because I'm switching dramatic, dramatically to uh, different values. And uh, you know, brush mixing is kind of nice because it allows you to evaluate on the palette whether the color's gonna, color is going to work. Um, so if you have old colors on the palette, you can compare them to the new ones that you're mixing. So one of the things that I noticed is that there's a dark area in the bottom right of the reference photo, and it transitions uh, to be much lighter as we go back and to the left. So um, what I want to do is kind of use the original value as the back left area, and then darken and fade out in that direction. Fading is very difficult with acrylic because it dries so quickly, so it really depends on your use of either water or matte medium or some kind of medium to thin it down so that you can create uh, glazes as you go back. And a glaze is basically just a semi-transparent layer of paint. So you see a little bit of what's under as well. And that allows you to use one color but get a whole range, or like one mix, one pile of paint, and get a whole transitionary range because you're only using a little bit. You're letting the under layer shine through. And get away with pushing that value down further as well. So when you use transitions, they kind of have to have like a decently big value range between them. Um, you should need a certain amount to get that across. Um, you don't want to go too far though. If you go too far, you change the overall value of the shape. And we don't want to change the overall value of the shape outside of the uh, middle gray that it's inhabiting. Um, later on when we use sort of full color, um, we'll do things like transition value and color. So that's just something to keep in mind. So if you get a handle on these value transitions, that'll make things easier later. Um, then the other thing that you can do in this stage um, we've got the main transitions and main shadows laid out, is you can begin to incorporate essential detail. Um, I don't think that I would want to paint every little single rectangle on this whole thing, on a six by eight painting like this. But what I do want to get across is some of the main architectural details, because there are two engaged columns that are very distinctive going up. There are some larger windows that are very dark and you know, I want maybe want to get the doorway over um, kind of towards the bell tower. Um, and I can lay those out very simply with relatively low contrast darks. I don't need them to be, um, you know, full black for them to work. In fact, if I, if I use the values from the actual photo, they're almost black and, and totally absent of any color. And if I use those, they would just jump off the 
page and be like their own little distinct cutouts. So part of this exercise is to use um, minimum effective contrast. And um, these darks that I've mixed are kind of distinct from the middle value of the building itself, but they're not so dark that I'm destroying the relationship of these shadows to the building. You know, if I use something too dark, it would be it would be really um, it would make everything kind of pull apart and disunified. Okay, so there I've laid in the large window here in the front. And then um, there's a smaller window in the background. So I need to lay that out, perhaps get a slightly darker value. So that it actually shows up within the shadow. And then getting the doorway in there is really critical because that's a main area of shadow and it's fairly dark. But again, I don't have to make it like full black and really obvious like it would be in the photo. I can lift it towards the middle. Then I can also work in the opposite direction. Like I can use a slightly lighter value than what's been laid out on the actual building and um, I can make some changes as well. The other thing too is that there's there are distinctive dark areas on the tower itself. Like there's these three little windows up top and then two sets of two windows in these archways below it. And so I can kind of just indicate where those are. And then there are four uh, sculptural niches right there that I can uh, snag as well. And then um, I can keep finding details. Like I can find a darker value in the, in the upper part of the window and just dab it and transition it downward just a little. Um, so I can also work on transitions in small areas. Then I think it's important on these engaged columns to throw in some of the architectural detail there as well. Um, and I can very loosely dab those in I don't want to spend forever um, on the details because that's a lot of tedium that's not really worth it per se. Um, but what I can do is get the detail that my brush size allows. And you know that's something that's part of your distinctive style too is, you know, I have a brush that's like literally when I dab it once, it's the size of this whole window that I'm trying to paint. So I can't get in there and like, you know, be really fussy about the exact shape of the window or anything. I just have to dab it once and be done with it. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of fun and, and, um, and interesting. And then I have to make sure that when I repeat elements of the architecture, I have to make them smaller as they go back. So those things that I've done on the front engage column, on the back one, uh, the one to the left, I have to make smaller. So just something to keep in mind as well. Um, then on any perspective lines, I can be sure that that uh, I, I can add some details and I want to be sure that, that where they don't line up, um, I change the and break up the line. Like if the line goes around an engaged column, it changes slightly, right? Like it, it doesn't go straight through the engaged column. So if I pick up on that slight detail, that helps me a lot. Um, and then what I have to do is like look for lines that are distinctive and, um, and major. If I squint really hard, I only see kind of the ones at the top and maybe one or two lines at the bottom. Um, I don't 
want to go in painting every single line that I see on this thing. I just want to snag the important ones. If I worked on this forever and I want to get a, a hyper rendered one in, in miniature, I could get a very, very small brush and do a lot of a lot of detail, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes because we're just trying to figure out uh, another concept here. We're figuring out essential detail, characteristic detail, and transitions. Um, you know, even eliminating all the detail, I would rather see just a flat building with good, uh, good transitions than a hyper detailed building. So if I had to prioritize, I would say, you know, your first priority is to get the shapes right and get an interesting design. Your second priority is to get the value range laid out correctly with a dark, medium, and a light value in your composition. Um, if there are two medium values or two dark values, you want to have temperature shifts to differentiate them. And then from there, within each of those shapes, you want um, to pick up on any transitions in value and color that happen. Um, after that, you have things like detail and, and so on. So here, lightening up certain areas of this uh, will begin to help the, the transition as well on this. Because if I dab down a light on this and gauge column that's further back, if I if I get a brighter and stronger light on the on the next time it repeats, that's helping with the transition because the value is shifting slightly. Now, I I wind up losing some of the the shapes in the niches, but that's okay, or the windows, because you know I'm not as concerned with that shape as I am with the value transition. So here I'm going for a, a brighter value. On this next engage column. And then the funny thing about using matte medium and acrylic is sometimes it um, it dries differently than you put it down. So you, sometimes you have to keep going back into it and making tweaks maybe sneak in a light value of that triangle that's above the um, archway there. And then there's that distinctive uh, hit of light right under the window itself. And then intellectually, I don't necessarily see it in the reference, but intellectually I know that the left side of this bell tower is going to be lighter than the one facing us because of the way that the shadow is laid out. So in terms of painting, I want to give that side there um, a different value. Because that, that makes more sense. Because if I have a one-sided bell tower in the foreground and I have one-sided buildings in the background, I'm, I'm kind of fighting my ability to create depth. So if I use one side in the background, two sides, sort of more in the foreground, it's going to help me out. Um, next, I can, you know, re-evaluate my initial shapes. Like, there's a background shape way up high above there that I should probably uh, rejig a little bit and, and make it a little more distinctive. Um, get two tones in there, maybe I, maybe I want to sneak a dark in there. Or maybe I don't, and I just leave it as one simple shape. And then I want to make sure that I clean up any edges where values got overlapped in ways that they shouldn't. Like that, those dark shapes of the background buildings kind of overlapped the uh, the middle ground bell tower and cathedral area. So I need to go clean those up real quick. Then, you know. On something like this, you may need to clean your brush a lot because the value range we're working with is very narrow and you need to keep distinct values sometimes. Um, let's see. I have multiple directions that I can go next. I still haven't touched the people and I'll probably need to, I need to, to make sure that those get done, but those will probably be last. I haven't added a sky transition. 
In the reference photo, there is barely any transition of sky value, um, though I can tell that there is some transition from background to uh, foreground. So in the bottom left, I think it's much lighter than in the top right. So what I want to do in terms of a painting is like over-exaggerate that to bring that sense of light out so that I get a lot of contrast towards the bell tower um, where I have a lot of focus because that's like, you know, small shapes and then I can bring low contrast up to the front of this building where it's a big shape. Um, and, you know, I'm also remembering that I have like temperature and color shifts. So this is a, a cooler, um, like, dark-ish version of a light value. So it's above the middle value. Um, it's darker than, than what I've mixed previously for the background. And then I want to be sure that I um, glaze and transition that and use different brush strokes and different directions that I've used for the perspectival lines. I mean, I could use perspectival lines in the sky, but um, what I think is more interesting is to make them go perpendicular to the transition. So the transition is going from bottom left to top right, so I kind of make them diagonals, stacking up, maybe even curving a little bit um, against that direction. So even a subtle transition does a lot for the sense of lighting. Um, and I don't have to worry too much about going over the edge of this building because I am glazing very lightly. Um, if I go over it like that, it's kind of more disastrous, uh, but not too bad. Um, you can always wipe it up. Um, yeah, I use my fingers. It's probably not the best idea. Other people use rags or another brush with some water. Um, but now I've got a decent transition from uh, from the bottom left to top right in the sky, and I can go from there. Um, and I kind of paint this, this one's kind of subtle, like the way you do it might be less subtle and more subtle, but um, as long as you're getting a transition, I think that's what we're after, you know? Next, we're gonna switch gears and uh, work on people. So a quick brush cleaning, a little dab, just get most of the paint off and uh, I can use soap later um, to kind of get it fully clean. And for the people, I really need a smaller brush. Um, so I'm going to get down to a, a small round brush that where when I dab once, it'll be about the size of one of their heads. So um, I kind of need some darks and some lights for the people because um, they're kind of high contrast. And they're in the foreground, so high contrast makes sense. But I don't want them to be like the total focus, you know. Putting people within an architectural scene is always good because it helps with a sense of scale. Um, it helps give you something to relate to. Pure architecture can be really boring um, because you have no sort of human element. As soon as you add the human element, it gets more interesting to look at. And. Uh, what I want to do is think of people, especially groups, more as um, like one big shape with texture. So I can like dot a bunch of heads in there by just creating like a sort of grouping of heads texture rather than painting each person individually. The last thing I want to do is paint each person individually. Like that is way too tedious and time consuming um, and will take up um, too much brain space and head space. You know, here where I have groups of three or four, I can be a little more specific, but I also want to be very simple. And I think that's the theme of painting this semester is simple and specific. And um, that's where I want you to, like if you can keep repeating that to yourself whenever you get in trouble, it's just simple and specific, simple and specific. Um, you know, you want this to be unique to this grouping of people. You want the marks to be specific to this grouping of people, but you have to simplify it. You can't get all of the detail that you see in life or in the reference photo into your painting because the medium just doesn't really allow that, um, especially when we're working on small scales like this. So here I see a lot of warm colored shirts, warm whites and yellows. 
So I'm going to use that for this grouping of people. Um, you know, this is still operating more as a temperature shift. That's way too bright right there. So I can come back down and pull some of that up. And I can use some of that light over here where there's where I see some white t-shirts and get some light on the backs of some of these people. The other thing too is like this assignment isn't about being like perfect at this. It's about exploring this concept and what it can do for you. So the main thing that we're working on is, you know, having decent perspective because your underdrawing allows you to, to do that. And then getting your shape language set out, having your value range set out, playing with the color shifts, and then we're really the main concept we're stacking on top is transitions in value. So if you can get to that, that's the main goal. So for learning about transitions. And you know, even within these people there's transitions. There's size transitions. There's value transitions, there's color transitions, there's shape transitions. And then there's transitions from, you know, drawing one individual person like I'm doing over here on the left to drawing a whole big group of people because they all overlap on the right. So um, that to me is part of the critical part of this assignment is thinking about how you can transition from one place to another within the painting. And there's tons of ways to do that. You know, implicit in all of this is that you're also transitioning within one plane or one shape, but you're also transitioning from a you know, one-sided background to a two-sided middle ground to like kind of three-sided foreground. Um, and uh, there's lots of ways that we can explore the idea of, of transitions. The last thing that I have to do is ground these people with some cast shadows. And I can see the cast shadow direction in the reference. And that's going to really kind of take these from being floating people to people that exist in the space. The other thing that that does is that it allows um, some perspectival lines of the shadows to help me integrate um, the sense of dimension and the sense that, I'm, that they're standing on a plane as well. And then I want to be sure that they're kind of soft shadows, so I do need to, to get some of the matte medium in and glaze around the edges of those so they're not like really starred shapes. If this were bright sunny and I have a totally blue sky, I would need to have sharp shadows most likely. But this is diffuse light, very atmospheric, and so the shadows have to be very um, diffuse as well, with very sharp, soft edges. Doesn't mean they're not distinctive and they're not clear, just means they have soft edges. So. That's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed watching this. Give this a shot and see what you can come up with. Um, I think a good goal is to do uh, three to five of these um, in a week and see what you can come up with.